Welcome everyone here in the Bali to the Freedom Lecture and also welcome to the people who are watching from home through the live stream. Um, we are really happy and honored that we have a very special guest today for you. Um, it's the Cuban journalist Abraham Jimenez Enoa. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, and today he will share with us his story about freedom in Cuba. Um, and I have to mention that we would not be able to do this series of lectures without the support of Stichting Democratie and Media and Vivans, who give us the funding to invite international important speakers uh, to the Bali. So that is really great. Um, we will talk together with Abraham, but first we will listen to Edwin Koopman. He's a renowned Dutch journalist specialized in Latin America, and I would like to give him the floor. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, I've been traveling to Cuba for many years, for decades already, and um, yeah, I've been reporting on it for, uh, for VPRO Radio and for Trouw, basically. I've written a book about Cuba. It's already maybe 17 years old, <laughs> but I just heard last week that for the people who go there in the embassy still, it's like an uh, obliged literature, so I was very happy to hear that. Uh, it's, uh, the fact is it's very sad that that's the case, because it says something about what has changed, how much has changed. Um, when most of these 20 or 25 years I traveled to Cuba, um, it was a period where Fidel Castro was still there. And um, yeah, there was like a sort of estimation that when Fidel Castro wouldn't be there anymore then after his death, that things would change. Uh, maybe an expectation uh, um, expressed in uh, one of these uh, books of, um, uh, called Castro's Final Hour. Um, I forgot the, the, this uh, famous uh, uh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, US journalist. Thank you. I forgot to note it here. Um, and it was uh, like the suggestion was that uh, it was not only Castro's final hour, but also Castro, uh, Cuba's socialism final hour. Mm -hmm. And um, um, though the book was written a lot, many years before Castro's uh, uh, death, it was not really Castro's final hour when the book came out, but the expectation was still there. Now, Phil died in 2016, and if we see the country now, you can conclude that it's still in a very deep economical crisis. And those supporters uh, of the regime say that it's, uh, yeah, they're still st standing strong against imperialism and that uh, the US is to blame for all the problems which are there. At the end, uh, this is all still there at the cost of uh, an absolute absence of freedom and with a harsh repression to anybody, anybody who protests uh, against uh, the situation. Um, with other words, six years after Fidel Castro's uh, death, the system is still there, the same party is in power, and there's hardly any improvement in terms of economy and democracy. Um, at this moment, I'm writing a sort of analysis for the coming week to be, publish to be published in Trout 2, but with the question, what happened? Why is this the situation, and why didn't uh, the situation changed, and I, I like to see the, the Cuban, like say the Cuban, the Cuban regime as it was before, uh, standing on four pillars. One, they had a charismatic leader. Secondly, they were supported economically by Venezuela for the past 20 years. Um, they had a monopoly on information, and they had the repression. If we look to the situation now. The charismatic leaders have gone. I mean, Fidel died and Raul Castro is still there in the background, but he is not playing a very visible role now. Uh, the economic support vanished because uh, Venezuela itself is now in a difficult uh, economical situation. Internet made the monopoly of, uh, of information like uh, obsolete. I mean, now the monopoly of information by the state has disappeared. So what remains is the repression. And that's what we're seeing now. In the past weeks, I've been investigating a lot um, uh, about what's going on at this moment, talking to many people by telephone, by WhatsApp, uh, also by other c social media. Um, if we see what's going on now, six months after um, spontaneous protests, which uh, were uh, in, uh, the, uh, present in July, against what started as economic situation, the lack of, uh, of vaccine, vaccines, um, the lack of electricity, etc., which turned into a uh, national burst out against uh, the lack of freedom and for democracy. 
We are now six months later and we see that young people who protested there in July are being judged at this very moment to eight to 30 years imprisonment. Um, there are over 50, 50 minors, people like younger at 18, being judged up to 18 years in prison. Um, there are about 15 kids between 16 and 18 who are in jail at this moment waiting for their final verdict to be given probably uh, this coming week. Um, mothers who demand the freedom of their kids are being harassed and detained themselves. Um, then the, co the government comes, they made a, a very um, a rare publication last week about the judgments. The, um, and they said, well, they were being there was violence, uh, the kids were throwing stones, uh, they turned cars, cars upside down, etc. So there were lootings. But still then, um, most of the people who went out on the streets in July were just protesting and demand freedom. Now, um, what I see as a, as a Cuba watcher is um, an incredible repression going on at this very moment at levels we have only seen a few times in the past 20 years. Um, at the same time, I see many people, much more people than before, um, who have apparently lost their fear to protest. This, um, um, this, this, these people who went out to the streets in July was really the first time in many, I think in decades, that people get, went out so massively, which says something about the loss of, uh, the loss of fear. Um, but also families at this moment who come out to, um, to um, protest against, uh, against the, the, um, the verdicts and against the, uh, the imprisonment of their kids. Um, so let's say, finally, something has changed. As I said, I think that the regime is only relying on repression at this moment. And at the same time, we see many people who are, we have the courage to speak out and, um, and to protest against the situation. So um, I think, I'm sure that, uh, uh, these people, uh, they, uh, they, they require a voice. That's my work as a journalist. I'm nothing more than a voice of uh, people who don't have them there. Uh, but the real voice, uh, one of these people, these brave people who uh, uh, come up and speak out, we have, them, we have them here in our middle, is Abraham. So uh, with that, I want to conclude my, uh, my introduction and uh, well, turn it over to the real voice of today, Abraham. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. We will um, speak to you later uh, today, but first we are going to our uh, guest of honor. Um, Abraham Jimenez Enoa is a journalist. He writes for the Washington Post. He has co-founded the online magazine El Estornudo, um, and he's going to do his lecture in Spanish. That's why, um, for all of you who don't speak Spanish, uh, we will hand out the translation for you to read along with him. Please give him a warm welcome. Les quiero eh, pedir un favor, es sencillo, eh, solo tienen que abstraerse. Imagínense que están en, en un avión y que aterrizan en una isla del Caribe que no tiene nombre. Cuando bajan de la escalerilla, eh, el, sol, el, el cielo es azul, corre una brisa perfecta que mueve las hojas de, la, de los árboles y el clima es perfecto. El, esa isla que no tiene nombre eh, tiene unas playas hermosas pero no solo el atractivo son las playas las ciudades también son sumamente atractivas eh, porque por las calles ruedan autos antiguos de mitad del siglo pasado y podemos encontrar también eh, a muchos músicos mucha, mucha música en vivo en la calle eh, un poco cuando estás en la calle sientes que estás en otra época Los habitantes de esa isla eh, son sumamente joviales, son sumamente conversadores y siempre están en las puertas de las calles, en los balcones, en, en la calle en general. Lo que le da una, una cierta expresión sonora y de ahí quizás que ese sea el secreto para que eh, eh, sea una isla donde la música sea fundamental y donde a estos isleños le encante bailar. Es una isla donde se puede disfrutar mucho de la, de, de la música pero no solo de la música, sino de la música, de la cerveza, de ron, pero sobre todo de ron, 
porque el ron, tienen un ron exquisito. Pero no van a creer que todo en esa isla es diversión. Eh, en esa isla la educación es gratuita y privada y no hay ni una sola escuela eh, privada. Es decir, todos los niños y adolescentes van a, a las mismas escuelas, ya sea el hijo de un barrendero, el hijo de un eh, científico o el hijo del mayor negociante o el mayor delincuente de la isla. En la salud pasa lo mismo, es gratuita y privada y, y no hay ni un solo hospital privado. Además, eh, los científicos de la isla ahora durante la pandemia crearon cinco candidatos vacunales, de ellos tres ya son vacunas, aunque no están reconocidas por la eh, Organización Mundial de la Salud. Además, esa isla, que no tiene nombre, eh, envía a Eurasia, a África, a América Latina, a, a sus doctores para ayudar y darle servicio médico a, no solo en tiempos de catástrofes de catástrofe, catástrofe naturales, sino en tiempos normales. Eh, en el deporte, eh, los isleños han alcanzado en toda la historia de, la, de, de los Juegos Olímpicos 284 medallas, de ellas, 235 medallas, de ellas 84 de oro. Pero no vayan a pensar que todo en esa isla es color de rosa eh, y que es un paraíso. Las personas como ustedes que van en un avión y aterrizan en un paraje que no lo conocen, eh, no saben que la educación y la salud no funciona como les dicen, porque los doctores, los maestros y todos los isleños en general tienen salarios paupérrimos y además todas esas instalaciones se están cayendo a pedazos. Además, las personas que aterrizan en esa isla que no la conocen no saben que realmente no existe tal solidaridad médica porque el gobierno de esa isla cobra por ese servicio de salud y es incluso el segundo renglón después del turismo, estoy hablando antes de la pandemia, eh, que, más, que más ingreso de divisa ingresa al país. Y además le quita el 80% del salario de esos médicos que van a parajes desconocidos en los mapas. Eh, y si alguno de esos médicos que ya están perdidos en esos mapas decide salir eh, y, a, y abandonar esa vida que la, que la ONU ha eh, eh, reconocido como esclavitud moderna, eh, esos médicos que abandonan esas misiones no pueden volver a regresar a la isla durante ocho años. Lo mismo pasa por ley, lo mismo pasa con el deporte. Y en el deporte en particular, eh, como en esa isla, el deporte no es profesional, no está permitido el deporte profesional. La, los deportistas que deciden eh, acceder a contratos eh, individuales, eh, luego no pueden eh, representar a su isla y tampoco pueden regresar en ocho años. Eh, para que lo entiendan más claro, si eh, Memphis Depay se fue a Barcelona, eh, no puede representar a jugar a Barcelona, no puede representar a Holanda simplemente por default, por irse a Barcelona por salir del país. Pero los que aterrizan en la isla tampoco saben que, esos cinco, eh, que, que a pesar de esos cinco candidatos vacunales eh, durante la pandemia, cuando tú sales de la isla, las farmacias son auténticos cementerios. No hay ni una sola pastilla para el dolor de cabeza ni para ninguna otra necesidad. Es una odisea medicarse en la isla. Pero ya no es que es una odisea medicarse en la isla, es una odisea poner un plato de comida encima de la mesa. Todo esto sucede porque el gobierno que gobierna en la isla, eh, todo lo que hace y todas las políticas que dicta son, están dirigidas simplemente a perpetuarse a, hasta la eternidad. Eh, dos hermanos eh, han estado de, 2010, de, de 1950, estuvieron desde 1959 hasta 2018. Ellos, do, entre ellos dos solos se repartieron la presidencia del país. Eh, el gobierno de la isla lleva 63 años en el país. El gobierno de la isla solo permite la existencia de un solo partido político, el comunista. No permite la existencia de ninguna otra organización, de ninguna otra eh, índole. Pero además de esto, también está prohibida la, la, la libertad de asociación, la libertad de reunión y obviamente la libertad de prensa. Y la, en la isla intentar acceder a alguna de estas libertades eh, te puede costar la cárcel. La prensa, que es el lugar donde yo me he movido durante los últimos años, está subordinada completamente al Partido Comunista. Eh, 
todas las emisoras de radio, todos los canales de televisión y todos los periódicos que hay en esa isla que no tiene nombre, eh, están dirigidas por miembros del Partido Comunista. Es por eso que como no está permitida ninguna organización que no sea comunista y como no está permitida la, 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 la prensa independiente, eh, eh, es normal que un periodista independiente como yo un buen día pueda ir caminando por la calle y bajo ese sol eh, bonito, bajo ese cielo tan azul, bajo esa brisa tan eh, hermosa y agradable y puedes ir tomando un helado y de, te frene a tu costado un carro particular, se bajen unos hombres y sin explicación te atrapen, te pongan unas esposas, te metan dentro de un carro y te llevan a una estación de policía. En la estación de policía, sin abogados, sin tener eh, derecho a que te defiendan, te desnudan, te amenazan con la cárcel y luego te, te liberan. Eh, en caso que después ya en tu casa, cuando estés procesando aquella obviamente arbitraria detención, eh, quieras acceder a, a un abogado, este abogado no va a responder a tus intereses, va a responder a los intereses de los que te secuestraron. Porque en la isla no hay, eh, eh, los tres poderes están unidos, no hay diferencia de poderes. Es decir, tanto el judicial como el ejecutivo, eh, como el legislativo, eh, responden al Partido Comunista. También puede suceder que un día normal, pongamos un domingo, bajes a botar la basura y solo pongas un pie fuera de tu casa y varios hombres vestidos de civil y otros uniformados te impidan salir de tu casa y te digan que estás en prisión domiciliaria, sin ninguna explicación, sin haber cometido ningún delito. Luego, estás en tu casa por tiempo indefinido, eh, hay quien ha estado días, hay quien ha estado semanas y hay quien ha estado meses, meses prolongados, 200 días sin poder salir de tu casa, rodeado por un operativo policial como si fueras Bin Laden, como si fueras un terrorista. Pero no todo termina ahí. Ya luego estás en tu casa y la única empresa de comunicación, repito, la única empresa de comunicación que hay en la isla te corta el teléfono fijo, te corta tu teléfono eh, móvil y te corta el internet para dejarte absolutamente desconectado del mundo. Y también puede pasar que de pronto estás encerrado en tu casa, en esa prisión domiciliaria y de pronto prendes el televisor y te encuentras a ti mismo. Estás sentado en, la, en, en cadena nacional, estás viéndote hablar eh, un discurso manipulado, eh, editado. Fue aquel día que te detuvieron, en que cuando te desnudaron, cuando te secuestraron, y ahora te venden como un agente de la CIA para el pueblo. Esto sucede en la isla porque la prensa independiente es el principal enemigo eh, del país. Es el principal enemigo desde la llegada de Internet a Cuba. Tengo, bueno... Eh, o bien el nombre que acabo de decir, eh, eh, es el principal enemigo porque eh, so, han sido los que han sacado a la luz toda eh, la realidad de esa isla que, que había estado escondida tras décadas. Y al ser los principales enemigos y, y no tener un respaldo legal, por eso es que eh, son atropellados de, de esta manera. Eh, por eso son perseguidos, por eso son acosados, pero no solo... Eh, los periodistas independientes solo, sino sus familias y, su, y sus amigos. En mi caso particular, amigos míos han sido llevados a calabozos por la sencilla razón de ser amigos míos, para sacar la información sobre mí, para amenazarlos, para eh, alejarlos de mí. Familiares míos le ha pasado lo mismo y además han sido expulsados de su centro de trabajo. Han sido expulsados de su centro de trabajo porque el Partido Comunista y el gobierno que gobierna en la isla eh, es el dueño de todo. Los medios de prensa, además, independientes en la isla están todos bloqueados. Están todos bloqueados y para acceder a ellos, eh, hay que, para burlar esa censura, hay que entrar eh, eh, a través de eh, VPN o, o, o de proxys. Eh, porque obviamente no está permitida que, que se impriman eh, la, la prensa independiente. Pero la falta de libertad de expresión en la isla trasciende eh, a la prensa independiente, a, lo, a los opositores y a los activistas. Eh, llega a punto de que si un ciudadano común eh, hace una crítica en redes sociales y condena al gobierno o sencillamente da un like eh, en, en cualquiera de sus redes sociales, puede ser multado. 
y esas multas ascienden a mucho más del salario paupérrimo que hay en la isla. Y si esos ciudadanos no pagan esas multas, obviamente pueden ir a la cárcel. Pero el gobierno de la isla no solo tiene eh, un ejército militar y policial que, que, que reprime, también tiene un ejército virtual, un ejército virtual que acosa y persigue en las redes sociales con perfiles falsos a cada uno de los activistas, a cada uno de los, de los periodistas independientes y a cada uno de los, de los ciudadanos. Eh, hace tan solo tres meses, eh, seis ciudadanos de esa isla eh, ga eh, ganaron el, el premio más importante de, en la música, del idioma de, que se habla en, esa, en la región donde está enclavada esa isla. De los seis eh, músicos, eh, solo cinco pudieron acceder a ese escenario. Eh, ¿Saben por qué eh, faltó uno? Porque estaba en una prisión. ¿Y por qué estaba preso? Porque esa canción que ganó el premio más importante de la, de, del idioma, de la música que se habla en esa isla, eh, se ha vuelto un himno eh, libertario de, de esa isla. Obviamente la isla de la que les hablo, ya lo tienen claro, es Cuba. Y es el país donde he vivido eh, la mayoría de mis 33 años. Eh, de hecho, eh, he salido eh, por primera vez hace unas pocas semanas de esa isla, no por decisión propia. He salido porque justamente por hacer periodismo, el gobierno me castigó hace más de cinco años y no eh, me dejaba salir justamente para que yo no me parara y tomara un micrófono como estoy haciendo ahora y pudiera contar eh, lo que le estoy contando a usted. Eh, Cuba es un país donde cada vez es más, más difícil expresarse. Cuba es un país donde hoy eh, hay 1.382 personas, eh, bueno, en julio fueron 1.382 personas detenidas a raíz de las protestas de julio, eh, donde hay eh, alrededor de 50 niños entre estas personas por el solo hecho de salir a la calle a decir eh, lo, lo que pensaban, a, a ejercer su derecho de expresión. Eh, donde el gobierno durante todo el, el año 2021 cometió, oigan bien la cifra, 7.293 acciones, 7.293 acciones contra la prensa independiente y contra la sociedad civil. Y un país ubicado por eh, Reporteros Sin Fronteras en el lugar 171 de 180 países en el ranking mundial de la libertad de expresión, de la, de la libertad de prensa. Cuba es entonces eh, una isla, eh, o esa isla de la, que, de la que les he hablado hoy, un lugar sin duda hermoso, con unas personas encantadoras, pero donde decir lo que se piensa es un delito. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that beautiful speech and, and come sit here with me. Um, I also have to introduce to you uh, Letizia Matamala. Um, she will be translating uh, this conversation into English. Very happy that, that you can be here. Um, so, Abraham, it was a very impressive speech. And what I noticed is that you um, highlight both the sides of Cuba. So. On the one hand, the equality, um, the equality of healthcare, of education, some some good intentions were made there. How do you see um, how the regime is um, uh, uh, doing it, and the theory that lies behind it? Does that uh, come together, or is there a big difference in uh, the theory and the practice? No, eh, eh, justamente empecé intentando eh, contar lo que la manera que el gobierno cubano intenta vender a Cuba. Eh, eh, justamente el discurso gubernamental intenta vender un país que es paradisiaco para muchos a nivel de ideología, a nivel de, de, de ocio, eh, y, y obviamente eh, no es así. Entonces, es totalmente contradictorio. Eh, cuando uno eh, vive la realidad de Cuba y, y cuando uno ve o lee los discursos gubernamentales o la, o la prensa, bueno, eh, es un horror llamarle prensa a la prensa oficialista de ese país. Eh, okay. yes, that, um, 
That's uh, precisely what I tried to do at first. Uh, I wanted to tell you how uh, the Cuban government tries to sell Cuba. And uh, it's what I, I try to express. Um, it's really, they try to uh, paint it as a paradise, uh, as well as uh, ideology uh, is concerned, and also free time. Um, obviously, that's not the case. It's a, a contradiction. And if you live in, uh, Cu in Cuba, the Cuban reality, you see that this is not the case. Um, and that a freedom of press is, is not existing. Um... Y, y es una cuestión con la que hay que lidiar. Eh, en un momento de la historia de los 63 años del régimen cubano, eh, eh, todo esto, con lo que empecé diciendo, sí funcionaba. Bueno, un poco lo dije, pero ya hoy eh, todo es un mito. Entonces, eh, 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 en, en un sentido que... que que los derechos fundamentales a los que pueda, y las libertades a los que puedan ser los, los ciudadanos, los habitantes de ese país, estén completamente vetados, eh, 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 hecha por tierra cualquier otro tipo de intento de, de política eh, eh, humana eh, o de sentido de, de progreso. Uh -huh. If you look at uh, Cuba's history of the uh, past uh, 63 years, um, you uh, see that what I started uh, my speech, uh, what I started telling you, um, it, it did function at that time. But nowadays, it's really a myth. Um, in the sense that uh, fundamental rights and freedoms uh, of all citizens uh, are completely blocked. And any effort of politics to uh, do otherwise, uh, it's not valid. Yo en realidad no creo que haya una contradicción. Yo sencillamente creo que fuera de Cuba lo que hay es un concepto erróneo de lo que es eh, Cuba. Eh, inevitablemente uno entiende el romanticismo que pueda despertar la, la revolución cubana, lo que fue en su momento, pero de eso no queda ni la, ni la ceniza. Obviamente, eh, a nivel teórico, cuando uno lee o cuando eh, 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 repasa la historia o lo que intentaron hacer, obviamente es muy difícil estar en contra de lo, de lo que intentaron hacer. Pero lamentablemente, justamente por querer perpetuarse en el poder, eh, todo eso se torció y hoy no queda prácticamente nada de, de eso. Y, y es todo un performance. Ellos, todo el tiempo dicen y hablan y, y se montan en, en una carroza eh, para vender esa imagen cuando eh, lo único que queda es la tumba. So, um, I would like to say that the idea of, which exists outside of Cuba of what Cuba is, is really a, an, an, it's an error. It doesn't exist. And uh, unavoidably, uh, you understand that there is a certain romance uh, if you think about what the Re Cuban Revolution was and what pe how people uh, viewed this revolution. But now, uh, not even the ashes of that revolution remain. And in theory, if you revise history, then you see that they tried to do something. They tried to. Uh, um, put an effort to do something, and you cannot be against that effort. Um, unfortunately, they try to stay in power, the regime, and uh, that is why now nothing is left of, of that... Uh, that effort. That effort, yes. They only uh, perform, and they say, and they uh, try to sell an image, uh, but um, really there's nothing left. When was the first time that you encountered repression as a journalist, that you thought about, that you noticed that you can't write what you want? You can't write what you want. That he can't write what he wants. Bueno, eh, bueno, siempre he escrito lo que he querido. De hecho, me ha pasado todo esto por querer escribir lo que he querido. Eh, 
eh, pero imagino que sea como el primer pasaje de represión, ¿no? Mm -hmm. I have what I wanted, and um, that is uh, why this has happened. Uh, but I expect you mean the first time that I experience uh, repression. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, in March of 2016, I eh, founded a journal of journalism independent. I started the access to the internet in the country. A year antes they had opened 33 places public in the whole country, where había que ir y pagar dos dólares para una hora de internet y había que sentarse en el suelo, o en, la, en una mata, en un banco, abajo del sol, abajo de la lluvia. Pero aprovechamos esa, esa brecha y fundamos una revista de periodismo narrativo. Um, okay. So, in March 2017, um, we founded a, a magazine uh, in, where we practice independent journalism. And internet um, came to Cuba around that time. Uh, a year before that, uh, they opened on 33 uh, public squares, uh, places where you could access internet. Uh, you had to pay $2 and uh, to be one hour on, on the internet. And we would have to sit on the floor or on the grass or uh, in the rain, but still, we uh, took advantage of this opportunity and founded this magazine. Um, eh, bueno, empezamos a, a contar Cuba de una manera en que obviamente el gobierno no le gustaba. Y así fue como llegó. Yo era el director de la revista. La revista sigue, pero yo salí de la revista hace un año y medio. Um, Y bueno, así llegó el primer eh, eh, pasaje. Hasta ese momento, obviamente yo era un poco naif en el sentido de que pensaba que todo lo que un poco conocía de la prensa independiente o de la represión a los opositores, a los periodistas, eran fantasmas. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the moment when we started to um, describe Cuba, to talk about Cuba um, in a different way, uh, a way that this displeased the government. I uh, founded this magazine. I was its head also. Uh, the magazine still exists, but I um, uh, quit this a uh, uh, year and a half ago. And uh, this was our first step. Um, and up until then, I had been rather naive about independent press and uh, their um, retaliations yes. to, to them. To them. Um, because I thought, well, this is not as bad as it seems. Y un día eh, estaba escribiendo en la mañana en casa y se fue la luz, la corriente eléctrica a las 7 de la mañana. No tenía cargada mi laptop y entonces llamé a mi madre, bueno, a mi abuela. Mi madre ya estaba en su trabajo. Y le dije que iba a su casa para poder escribir y conectar. Mi, ma mi abuela y mi madre viven en otro barrio para poder conectar al alto y poder escribir. Eh, y cuando voy en el camino, me llaman, me entra una llamada de un número desconocido a mi teléfono. Y era un agente de la seguridad que se presentó y que me había dicho que me, me dijo que sabía que yo no estaba en casa, que, que, que me quedara a donde yo iba, que ya sabía a donde yo iba. Sí, yo solo había hablado por teléfono, que me quedaba ahí, que me iban a buscar. Yo le dije que no, que tenía que trabajar, pero bueno, cinco minutos después, tocaron a la puerta en casa de mi madre, un carro sin chapa, ese no tenía chapa, un lava, auto soviético, y bueno, sin explicación, eh, eran tres agentes vestidos de civil, me cargaron, me quitaron mi teléfono, me quitaron mi laptop, y y me llevaron a, a, en las afueras de La Habana. A, eh, es 100 yardas de abo, pero es como donde radica la, eh, la seguridad del Estado, que es el brazo represor del régimen. Uh -huh. Y bueno, luego ahí estuve 11 horas de interrogatorio. One day I was writing uh, early in the morning, and suddenly electricity fell out. Fell out. There was a blackout. It was around 7 a.m. And I hadn't charged my laptop. So I called my um, mother's house, or my grandmother, rather. 
and uh, said to her that I was going over to uh, charge my laptop and to keep on working. Um, then when I was on my way to, to them, uh, an unknown number called me. Um, and the one that called me uh, identified himself as someone from state security. He said that he knew that I was uh, going, uh, he knew where I was going and that I had to stay at home. Um, I said, no, I cannot because I have to work. And suddenly a car appeared. Uh, it was a Lada, a Soviet car uh, without a, a license plate. And three agents stepped out. Um, they took everything from me, my telephone, my laptop, and they um, brought me to a place outside of Havana, to a place that, uh, known uh, where the state security uh, is. And they held me there uh, for interrogation uh, during 11 hours. Allí eh, estuve 11 horas. Eh, eh, era un cuarto extremadamente pequeño un frío bestial, eh, eh, tenían puesto un aire acondicionado intencionalmente y me interrogaron durante 11 horas, el interrogador tenía un folleto con lo que yo había escrito hasta ese momento y me lo leía y, me, y leía cada párrafo, cada palabra y me decía ¿qué tú quieres decir aquí? ¿por qué dices esto? Se iba, me dejaba solo, no había, me habían quitado mi reloj, eh, yo no sabía qué hora era, eh, Entré como a las nueve de la noche, y a las nueve de la mañana y salí de noche. Y eh, jugaban como al tiempo, salía de la habitación, me dejaba solo un, un momento, me decía que si me iban a detener, que si no iba a salir más. Y ahí fue cuando yo entendí lo que es el totalitarismo en Cuba. Porque durante esas once horas eh, ellos me, eh, me dejaron claro que me seguían a cada lugar, que me tenían intervenido mi teléfono que cada persona, que cada movimiento que yo hacía tenían conocimiento. Por ejemplo, eh, me dijeron cosas así como, eh, el día 3 de enero estabas almorzando con Frankie de Jong, eh, ¿qué hablaste con él? ¿Quién pagó la cuenta? Eh, y es como, yo ni me acordaba que yo había hecho el 3 de enero y ellos sabían que yo había almorzado con Frankie de Jong. Eh, sabían con, en ese momento... Eh, con quien yo te, tenía intimidad, bueno, lo sabían todo acá y, y fue bien impactante. Siempre lo, no fue tan agresivo como otro tipo de pasaje a nivel físico, pero a nivel eh, psicológico sí fue muy impactante porque fue el primero y fue como, puff, descubrir al, al monstruo. Uh -huh. Recuerdo una cosa curiosa. Well, bueno, <laughs> So I was held up there um, during 11 hours in a very small room. It was extremely cold. They had put on the air conditioning uh, very high intentionally. Um, so I was there the, those 11 hours and the one who interrogated me had uh, uh, papers. He had my articles. And uh, sometimes he read some uh, p uh, some lines. He says, yes, yes, some lines, asking me, uh, why did you say this? Why did you write this? And he uh, came into the room and out of again. Uh, they had t taken my watch, so I didn't know what time it was. I think I went in at uh, 9 a.m. and I came out uh, at night. Um, and to me, uh, th they knew everything about me. Um, I, um, they told me that I was detained and that I could, uh, they could hold me there. Um, for me, it was the moment uh, that I understood what uh, a totalitarian regime, regime uh, is. Um, so I discovered that they followed me, that uh, my uh, phone was tapped, that they knew uh, the person that I ac acquainted with or my friends. Uh, for example, they told me uh, on January the 3rd, you were eating with Frankie de Jong. Uh, <laughs> what did you say? Who paid the bill? Uh, sincerely, I didn't re even remember that I had lunch with him, uh, but they knew. Wow. And it was uh, a huge impact for me. 
uh, not in the sense that it was very ag aggressive, but psychologically it was a huge impact because I discovered who the monster was. Did you think of quitting journalism after that experience? ¿Pensaste en dejar el periodismo después de esta experiencia? No, eh, la verdad no, pero eh, voy a decir lo que... Pero sí te, te, te aterra un poco, ¿no? Te mete como el temor. Cuando regresé después de esas 11 horas, como yo me había ido y no había corriente en la casa, me había ido a casa de mi madre, eh, obviamente estaban prendidos los interruptores. Y yo llegué y cuando abrí la puerta estaban los bombillos prendidos. Dije, wow. Me metieron y se metieron en mi casa, pero no, era que había llegado la corriente y se habían prendido los bombillos. Entonces es como que ya la vida te cambia completamente. Eh, eh, y, y, y tienes que medir cada uno de tus pasos y cada, con cada quien que habla. Vives una, una paranoia para nada sana. Eh, pero no, nunca, la verdad nunca dejé de, de hacer, eh, nunca pensé dejar de hacer periodismo. Eh, Justamente porque en, en Cuba somos como muy pocos los que nos atrevemos a, a, a contar esa realidad y sin falso heroísmo, sin ganas de ser mártires, eh, eh, es muy triste que, que, que a nivel histórico, a nivel eh, eh, y de prensa también, eh, nadie cuente lo que, lo que pasa ahí. Y entonces, eh, de pronto todo el gremio, eh, eh, o, o pienso yo, estoy hablando por todo, <risa> eh, eh, nos sentimos con una responsabilidad de, eh, de contar lo que pasa ahí, porque si no lo contamos nosotros, Nadie lo va, lo va a contar. Sí, va a ser muy triste que alguien coja un... Le decía ayer a unos chicos con los que me reuní acá, que es muy triste que alguien coja un periódico oficialista de Cuba en el 2070 y quiera saber lo que estaba pasando en el 2022 y de pronto le estén hablando de, de la zafra de azúcar y, y qué sé yo, lo que cuenta los periódicos cubanos. Uh -huh. Uh, no, tr truly no, I didn't think of quitting uh, journalism. Um, of course, you feel fear, you, you are afraid. And after these uh, 11 hours, I had left uh, home because there was no electricity and I had gone to my mother's. Um, but then when I returned home, I um, came in and I saw that all the lights were on. Um, and suddenly I thought, oh my God, they went into the house. But then uh, I thought, oh no, electricity is back. <laughs> so life changes completely uh, because of that, and you uh, start to be careful uh, to whom you speak, uh, whatever step you take. Um, you have a paranoia that's not healthy anymore. But no, I didn't think of quitting uh, journalism, precisely because uh, in Cuba we are very few who dare to speak of uh, reality of what is going on. And uh, I don't want to be a hero or a martyr, but it's very sad if you uh, consider history or the history of press that uh, no one speaks about what is going on. Uh, so I think uh, all of us uh, in my profession, I, I speak for everyone, we feel a huge responsibility of uh, speaking, of telling uh, what, what's going on. Um, yesterday, I was talking here to, um, to some, some guys, and I said to them, it, to me, it seems so sad that if, one, if anyone uh, in 2017 uh, reads an official newspaper, an official Cuban newspaper, so to, to know what happened in 2022, and if uh, uh, this person reads um, articles about the sugar cane or whatever the official newspapers write, um, that will be very sad. This is a great sacrifice you are making, um, which I find very brave. And I'm also curious how it impacts your friends and your family. No, mi familia está destrozada. <ríe> yo estoy mejor que mi familia. Eh, bueno, yo no lo veo como un sacrificio. Simplemente una decisión que tomé eh, en un contexto complicado y que eh, tiene consecuencias y condicionamiento. Eh, la verdad, mi familia lo ha sufrido más. Está totalmente quebrada. Eh, el núcleo familiar 
está destrozado, ya no se puede almorzar, no se puede cenar. Eh, igual mi familia es una familia pro gubernamental. Eh, eh, hay muchos militares, hay eh, militantes del Partido Comunista eh, y mucha gente tiene trabaja para el Estado. Entonces, eh, en un sentido tampoco comulgan con lo que yo hago. Pero, bueno, eh, sí se han sensibilizado con, con las cosas que me han pasado y, y sobre todo a raíz del, del pasaje de mi madre, ¿no? que justamente antes de la pandemia Sí, llevaba 20 años trabajando en un puesto laboral y sin explicación, bueno, la explicación era yo, la expulsaron de, de, de su trabajo justamente para presionarme a mí. Mi, mi padre también tuvo que jubilarse por presiones. Entonces en ese sentido es como sumamente complicado. Pero digamos que yo como estoy en la vorágine, eh, lo sufro menos, ¿no? Porque es como ellos, lo y, y obviamente tengo mucho cargo de conciencia. Eh, de lo que les pasa a ellos por mí, pero no es mi culpa, es el sistema. Eh, eh, uh -huh. Es muy triste. Uh -huh. My family has been destroyed. In fact, uh, I'm uh, much better off now than they. Um, I don't see this as a sacrifice. I see this as a decision that I made uh, in a complicated situation. And this decision has consequences. Uh, but yes, my family um, has been uh, destroyed uh, for a few time now. Um, we cannot have normal lunches or, or dinners together. Um, in my family, there are a lot of uh, people who are uh, pro the Cuban government, uh, lots of military um, in my family, also uh, active militants of the Communist Party. Uh, people who work for the state. Um, but yes, they have uh, more consciousness or they are more conscious about the situation um, due to what has I have lived. Um, especially my mother has suffered the consequences because uh, she worked uh, during 20 years uh, and she had a, a good um, job. And uh, she was expelled from her job uh, without any reason. That is to say, I am the reason. And that was a, a way of putting pressure on me. Uh, my father had to um, retire also to put pressure Forced on me. Forced retirement, yes. Forced retirement, yes. And um, so, yes, I, because of I am in the middle of the storm, I think I feel it less than uh, my family. And of course, I, I feel guilty about this, um, knowing that it's not my fault, but it's the system. Um, shortly, I will, uh, I will get our other speakers to join in conversation. Um, but my last question to you is, uh, Edwin talked about the internet and how much it changed everything. Um, do you see that there's a positive future there? ¿Tú crees que esto también significa que hay un futuro positivo en ese aspecto? En Cuba. En Cuba. <risa> <risa> eh, bueno, yo quiero creer que sí, pero todo indica que no. Eh, la situación está en un estado verdaderamente lamentable, eh, que incluso era muy difícil de predecir. Si Cuba siempre está mal, pero... Incluso dentro de ese mal estado era difícil predecir que iba a estar en el estado que está hoy. Eh, han pasado cosas como desastrosas, eh, Trump, la pandemia, eh, eh, la creación de una sociedad civil y eso ha hecho que el régimen eh, eh, lleve la represión a niveles insospechados, eh, la carestía, la escasez. Sí, el país es como una tristeza general, parece un país de una posguerra. Eh, los mercados, las tiendas, son cementerios, las farmacias, eh, niños presos, todo es así como nada indica que, que haya una mejoría pronto. Yo creo que eh, realmente todo pasa por eh, eh, una destrucción desde adentro, un poco lo que pasó en la Unión Soviética, una suerte de perestroika, Y, y, y faltan unos años para eso. Primero tiene que morirse Raúl Castro. Es muy triste que uno diga 
eso, pero es inevitable eh, 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 que, que todo pase por la muerte de Raúl Castro, eh, justamente porque después todo va a indicar que se va a dar una lucha de, de poder eh, por todos los hoteles y todas las, las empresas de, la FAR, de las Fuerzas Armadas que hay allí, eh, por el turismo. Y, y, y bueno, un poco ellos, como todo es un desastre, eh, van a tener que intentar como reformar la economía, reformar eh, un poco todo el país y va a suceder un poco lo que sucedió, o pienso yo, en la Unión Soviética, que van a, a mover tanto el edificio que se va a caer. Pero no creo que, que ahora mismo eso pase. Eh, yo creo que, que quizás, bueno, la Unión Soviética duró 70, Cuba va por 63. A lo mejor el, mi, mi vaticino acepta no sé, en 5, 7, 8 años. No sé, pero eh, no creo que más allá del empuje de la sociedad civil, que obviamente yo estoy a favor de eso, eh, 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 vaya a derrocar ese régimen. Es un, un pueblo totalmente desarmado. Eh, bueno, las protestas de julio lo reafirman. Gente que salió a la calle con carteles o simplemente con la única arma de su voz y ahora tienen penas de 20 a 30 años. Entonces, sí, no hay manera. Es una lucha de... uh -huh. imposible. I would want to believe that uh, there will be a change, um, but everything indicates that no, it, it won't be that way. Um, uh, Cuba as a state is in a bad situation. It has always been in a bad situation, but no one could have predicted um, uh, that it would be as bad as it is now. Um, And it has to uh, do with uh, lots of disastrous things, um, aspects. Uh, first of all, Trump, uh, the pandemic, um, uh, uh, lots of uh, aspects that have uh, contributed to this disaster. And in the country, there's an overall uh, sadness. Um, it almost looks as if it's a country uh, after a war. Um, markets, um, pharmacies, they're all void. Uh, children are in prison. So um, there is no sign that uh, anytime soon there will be improvement. Um, and after any change, there always will be a, a struggle about power. Uh, who gets the hotels, um, the companies owned by the, the armed forces, uh, tourism, uh, you name it. So, um, yes, after a change, there will have to be economic uh, reforms. The, the whole country will have to be uh, reformed. But I think it will happen in a way that happened in the Soviet Union. So they will uh, make the, uh, the building shutter, and then hopefully it will uh, collapse. But I don't think that will be now. Um, the Soviet Union lasted 70 years. We, we have only 63 years. So um, my prediction is that perhaps in six or eight years from now, uh, some change uh, can be possible. But right now, I don't think so. Okay, on that note, I would like to invite Edwin Koopman uh, to the stage again, Dutch journalist specialized in Latin America, and also Barbara Hogeboom, professor of Latin American studies at the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, welcome. Um, great that you are both here. Thank you. Um, and Edwin, to start with you, um, you reported on the, the protests that were in Cuba recently, the last few months. Lots of young people on the streets. Um, maybe the biggest protest since years in Cuba. Um, how do you explain that? What happened there? Well, well the protests were basically in July, uh, which was in fact only one day, the 11th of July, which is now like uh, it's the symbol of, uh, of discontent in Cuba, where, well, in fact, it started in a very small way in one of the villages close to, uh, to To Havana, it is a protest against uh, against electricity fallouts and uh, the lack of effect signs, etc. And um, thanks to social media and Facebook and 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 and, uh, and this spread to other places, and then it turned out to be a, a, like a national national uh, protest. Also, pro yes, yeah, bursting burst out of uh, discontent, and what started as a protest against scarcity. 
uh, turned out to be a protest for more freedom and against, uh, against repression and for democracy. Why had it happened? Well, I think just, I mean, as it started, as the, the problems are very big. And at this moment, prices are skyrocketing high. Uh, inflation is incredible. Uh, there's a lot of scarcity. People have real problems to get around, to get enough food. Um, apart from the electricity fallouts, etc., and the whole problems with, uh, with, uh, with COVID, with corona. So the discontent is big. And this was like a spontaneous outburst, outburst of, of discontent. Yeah which turned out to be, and then people went to the street and said, okay, now people, other people are on the street, I will go too, and, uh, and let's take advantage of the situation and, 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 and demand democracy. Yeah. Um, Abraham told us that more than 1,300 people were arrested uh, after the protest, also children. Um, Barbara, is that a, um, well, I don't want to say a smart way, but is it a way for the regime to repress other protests? Is that working? Well, it, it is what what often governments do <laughs> and in a way yes it can work uh, i mean i've been thinking quite a lot uh, before this meeting about parallels other parallels in latin america and experiences and this is of course you see now that the pressure from society towards regime is is mounting that also they start to repress uh, more and i'm afraid i have to agree with abraham that uh, although some unexpected events like the 11th of July have happened that uh, probably the situation will continue for quite some, some time despite uh, yeah, broad discontent because they have indeed, they have the arms, they have much more than just their voice yeah. as he was saying and um, so for, for quite some time that can continue and it's a very strong system. I mean, it has been there for a long time. It has dealt with previous waves of, you know, huge economic uh, problems. So, um, yeah. yeah, it can also change. I mean, it's also a bit hard to say. Maybe we should also try to see a little bit where the sparks of hope are. Um, but um, yeah, I think now many people have to decide either to stop saying things, stop going to the street or to leave Cuba. Yeah. Edwin, I, in your speech, I sensed a small bit of optimism. Um, how do you see it? Um, well, no, yeah, maybe the only, no, in fact, I'm not optimistic. Um, <laughs> if we see, no, it, if it see that the, the possibilities the regime still has, I think the fact that Cuba is an island plays a very important role, that people are not free, it's not easy to, to go in and to go and out, go out and, uh, and organize something. Um, it's completely controllable. Uh, they have the arms. Uh, and what's very important, I think, at this moment, we see again, like has passed many times in, in the past de decades, that the most critical people leave the islands. So those who are organizing or, are, or take the initiative or have lost the fear to do something, people like Abraham, um, uh, if, if they stay, they can, they can grow as a group. Mm -hmm. but you, what we see is that every generation would try something, and we have seen so many in the 90s. In the, then we have had the, the, the bloggers, then we had the, the, the vloggers, and, and we had the, the, like independent uh, journalists starting to trying something. And at the end, we saw the San Isidro movement uh, uh, two years ago starting with protests. It's a cultural movement, it's right? A, they were artists. artists yeah. And we see that every time after one or two years trying to organize and trying to gain a little bit of, of space, of, fr of liberty, of freedom, then at the end they are either uh, detained or harassed so much that they, they, they decide to, to leave and to go to either Spain or, or, or Latin America or the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. And they, they continue activities outside, but it's not the same. And then you, then you have to wait for a couple of years and you see another generation coming up trying to do the same. And yeah, I, so in the fact, I'm pessimistic. At the same time, one little thing is maybe you notice is that the fact that on the long range, if you see like in the past 20 years, like it seems like people have lost fear to go out and to, if we, we see this Patria Vida in this card, I, I suppose this picture is taken the 11th of July also. I mean, this is really, mm. di we haven't seen this. It's really before. powerful. Yeah, and, and it, you, we won't see this today. Today, nobody dares. But um, 
it can happen again. Yeah. So like this, we see people on, on social media, if you look at Twitter and you put hashtag 11G from 11th of July, you see a lot of people just on camera posting their comments, protesting um, and, and trying to get attention of the international community. Yeah. And that is rather new, I think. Yeah. Abraham, do you agree that there is in the, the younger generation or the new generation of protesters a loss of fear that they are more maybe Yo creo que eh, la llegada de internet al país le cambió la fisionomía, ¿no? Eh, justamente fue lo que hizo que, 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 bueno, que naciera esta generación que empujó eh, eh, estas protestas, que bueno, que son inéditas. Que igual que cuando uno ve en el tiempo, en 63 años, una sola vez, <ríe> el pueblo se tira en las calles a la medida del de, control de, 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 del gobierno. Eh, pero yo creo que justamente también que hay internet también va a hacer que hay un reciclaje de, de, de esa misma sociedad civil. La represión ha hecho que sí, que, que justamente toda esa generación a la que yo pertenezco, que nació tipo 2015, 2016, eh, como sociedad civil, eh, o esté en el exilio o esté en, en la cárcel. Eh, eh, pero igual cada vez más eh, salen activistas, salen periodistas independientes, salen eh, opositores, artistas contestatarios. Eh, y yo creo que eso no tiene fin, que, que es como una semilla que se sembró y que pese a la represión y pese a los miedos va cada vez a seguir brotando. I think I think that um, the arrival of internet changed um, the face of, of our country. And um, that is that an, an, a new generation was born out of that. Um, we have uh, 63 years of history now, and just one time uh, that the people took out to the streets and opposed uh, this government, just one time. Um, but I think that because of internet, this will recycle, this will happen again. Um, despite uh, retaliations and repression of the government. Um, I think my generation, to which I belong, uh, that started uh, speaking out in 2015, 2016, is now or either exiled or imprisoned. Um, but you see that uh, there are activists uh, rising up, journalists, independent journalists, um, artists that oppose government, And I think this has no ending. It's a seed that ha was sown, and it will blossom Continue. over and over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can yeah, I please. ask something about yeah. this? Because I think uh, that, that is very important, usually, if you want to mobilize um, critics of a system. I mean, you, you need an incentive, so a, a strong reason. I think there are very strong reasons in Cuba. But uh, you need the opportunity. I think with internet, at, at least, you know, some opening has happened. Uh, you told about the control of that, so I'm also curious how that is actually working, how that repression is happening at a digital space and about what you need is a capacity of, of people who are critical of the system to organize themselves and that is what I'm also curious about how are the people outside of Cuba and also those that are still there organizing is there a, a constant dialogue is there a, a, a movement a group that is really pulling these different uh, critical voices together um, before you answer, um, I see that there's someone with a question. We will come to you at the end of the program. There will be room for discussion. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, sí, la, bueno, la mayoría de la gente que, que ha salido, al menos en el último tiempo, para nada se desconecta de la, de la, de la, de la lucha en Cuba, de la de la realidad del país salen eh, y siguen conectados y siguen incluso está pasando algo que, que hace mucho tiempo bueno creo que, que es inédito que eh, de pronto a donde se van se, se generan como movimientos en el exterior fuera de cuba eh, de marchas protestas eh, que eso tan masivamente nunca había pasado eh, y da la medida que la gente eh, eh, está conectada siempre a lo largo de los años 
había una ruptura entre el exilio y la gente que estaba dentro de Cuba, justamente porque el gobierno lo, lo empujaba, hacía que, 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 que se iba, era como, ellos le llaman gusano, contrarrevolucionario, era como, se desaparecían del mapa, y la gente también lo asumía y de pronto se olvidaba como del país, eh, pero eso ya no está pasando, la gente sigue conectada. Lo que pasa es que una vez que sales, al menos desde el activismo, el radio de incidencia es mucho menor, ¿sabes? Como si estás en Europa o en otro lugar, bueno, en otro lugar, o incluso está más cerca, en Estados Unidos, México, qué sé yo, eh, igual, sin más allá de, de redes sociales, de, de conectarte, de estar empujando y tal, eh, a nivel físico eh, tienes como muy restringido eh, el alcance y el radio. Entonces, sí se siente, se siente un vacío, Ahora mismo se siente un vacío generacional, porque por más que todo el tiempo se recicle y salgan rostros nuevos, ha sido eh, eh, una ola de, de partida. Es decir, a partir de, 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 de Movimiento San Isidro, es decir, desde enero del año pasado, eh, se ha quedado vacío el país. Y bueno, no sé si quieras decir, y para pa apuntar una cosa. Um, so yes, um, most of the people that go abroad stay connected um, to the struggle in Cuba and to Cuba's reality. Uh, we we keep on uh, we maintain that connection, and uh, especially now, I think uh, we have we hadn't seen that before. That um, also abroad there is a movement. Uh, there are protests uh, going on abroad. And we hadn't seen that in the past, not in, at that level. Um, but yes, um, years ago, there was a, a, a rupture or a differentiation between the people who went into exile and the people who stayed in Cuba. And the government uh, took care that this difference uh, was big. So the people that went out were called gusanos or contra-revolutionaries. And uh, people assumed that there was this difference. Um, I would like to say, though, that if you uh, go abroad, uh, even if you stay active, uh, of course, and, and if you come to Europe or the United States or Mexico, which is much uh, nearer, um, you have the connection of, the, of social media. Uh, but obviously, you don't have this physical uh, connection anymore. And, and you feel that. Um, so yes, there is a lack, a generational uh, lack or, or void, if you could name that, um, because what you see is that of the Movimiento San Isidro, the San Isidro movement of January of the past year, um, you see that the people engaged there, uh, they're no longer there, so the, the country is void. Lo que quería agregar era que lo que pasa en Cuba hoy es tan grave y tan eh, triste que ni siquiera uno tiene que te tener la intención de volverse un activista eh, eh, para eh, oponerse a al gobierno. Justamente la propia realidad del país es subversiva, porque si tú no tienes cómo medicarte, pese a los cinco candidatos vacunales, eh, si no hay medicamentos en el país. Obviamente eso es una política para hacer política del gobierno cubano. Eh, si no tienes cómo comer, un país donde un huevo sea un lujo, como comerte un faisán, si tú no tienes eh, de cómo expresarte, eh, si no tienes cómo moverte, eh, porque no hay transporte, si la, los precios están eh, eh, tienen una inflación de un 70%, si la devaluación del peso cubano eh, asciende al 93, según Bloomberg, la, la última vez que consulté, y, y bueno, y declaró que la, que, que la moneda cubana es la más devaluada de todo el mundo. Eh, entonces, como, eh, ¿qué más da? Claro, por eso pasó lo que pasó en julio, que ni siquiera estaban detrás opositores, ni siquiera estaba detrás la sociedad civil. Explotó el país porque era una situación inaguantable. Inaguantable. Mm -hmm. I would like to add that um, what is happening in Cuba right now is um, so serious and so sad. 
that um, you uh, don't even have to be an activist. Uh, you just have to experience reality on, in Cuba. If uh, you don't have any medication, um, in spite of the six of uh, five, um, excuse me, uh, candidates of um, vaccines, if you don't have anything to eat, uh, if an egg is a luxury product, it's like eating a pheasant. Um, if you don't have uh, transportation, if you don't have freedom of speech, if prices go up as they do, um, uh, right now we have a rate of 70% of inflation, and according to Bloomberg, the Cuban peso is the most devaluated uh, currency in the world. Um, if you ho have all these things, then what? Um, this is, and this is what happened ju in July. Um, it's not because of activists uh, that this social uproar took place. It's because people couldn't stand it anymore. I want to talk a little bit more about the international community and um, the role they have, uh, because Cuba has historically a good relationship with Venezuela. Um, is that something that is still there, or is that not really a thing anymore? Ideologically speaking, politically speaking, yes, I think, to what I, to, as far as I know. But I think what is important for the survival of any regime is, is also the, the financial economic basis. And that is, of course, becoming more and more a problem. So um, both regimes are under pressure. Um, and, and we don't know whether one will fall in the, in the next few years. But um, yeah. So the support is, uh, its ideology is the same, but the economic hardship is also happening in Venezuela. Yes, yeah. although there are, uh, well, it's not an island, so there's also <laughs> a, a lot more smuggling of things um, and, and a, a mining sector, etc., and a, a, a big international kind of smuggling network uh, that supports also the, the current regime to stay in power. But there are quite a few parallels, of course, yes. And of course, this big problem that, um, in any situation where you have a lot of discontent in society and you have pressures internally and outside to make the, the people in power to move out, where can they go? Um, and that is, I think, a problem for, for um, yeah, in both countries. Um, you, I mean, many of, I was thinking of the, the experience we had in, Latin, uh, in the Netherlands before, Latin American refugees coming to the Netherlands in the 1970s and, and 80s. Um, and in the end, we saw a regime change there. Um, and how that happened was not like a big revolution. There was a lot of pressure in the country and inter internationally. But in the end, it's always also a negotiation with people, the kind of more moderates, the, the blandos um, in, in, in the country itself. So. And that I don't know. I don't see exactly uh, in Cuba or Venezuela um, how that is going to happen. You, you need to, to have to move those people that are in power, at least find some who are willing to, to start walking another direction. Yeah, so you need the pressure from within, but you also need the pressure from outside, yeah. from the international yeah. community. Is there enough pressure of, for instance, the European Union or other countries who are trying to... Um, to protect human rights in Cuba? That's a good question. Maybe we should ask it to Abraham. I don't, because I think that the, 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 the question if we need pressure, I mean, uh, the, the kind of pressure, the economic pressure, the embargo as the US is applying to, to Cuba in a way also actually keeps the, the current regime into power because into power, they always yeah. have that big enemy and that kind of excuse of the embargo. Um, the question if, is if there is sufficient support and, and um, yeah, maybe a, a bit that Dutch and also European history of supporting people who come to Europe um, to help them, uh, you know, can yeah. kind of be repeated in some way. But I think there is much more that can be done and also that also governments can be more outspoken. Yeah, so pressure is not a good word. It's maybe just the support of other countries, of other big European powers. Um, do you think that there is enough that gets done to help Cuba? 
pueda ayudarlos a ustedes? Yo creo que hacen lo que pueden, porque eh, en un sentido eh, eh, pueden hacer hasta un punto. Eh, Cuba está tan aislada y, y allí la incidencia de ONG, de, de ayudas extranjeras, de gobierno, está tan restringida que en, en muchos casos no tiene ninguna incidencia. Yo lo que sí creo, eh, igual yo no estoy a favor de la injerencia de ningún país. Eh, yo creo que el problema cubano lo tienen que resolver los cubanos. Uh -huh. eh, 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 y de ahí eh, llegar a, a una solución. Pero sí creo que la comunidad internacional sí tiene... Eh, eh, un gran problema y, y gran culpa en, en, en respecto a lo que es Cuba en cuanto a la opinión pública. Eh, sí, eh, sigue habiendo un consenso internacional errado completamente de lo que es ese país. Eh, se sigue pensando que Cuba es un país democrático, se sigue pensando que Cuba es un país eh, progresista, eh, se sigue pensando que Cuba es un país eh, de izquierda cuando es todo lo contrario. Y mientras la Unión Europea y el resto de los países siga a, asumiendo a Cuba como no lo es, eh, eh, va a seguir eh, 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 el mundo mirando, obviamente, eh, mal a Cuba. Es, decir, es inadmisible que Cuba se siente en, en, en a comer en la mesa de, del alto comisionado de los derechos humanos del mundo. Es como yo no es como una cosa incomprensible. Bueno, obviamente estaban Arabia Saudita y tal, y, pero bueno, yo estoy aquí hablando por Cuba. Eh, eh, porque lo que pasa es eso, que, que, que a mucha gente le conviene que, que Cuba siga siendo la vanguardia eh, de la izquierda, que siga siendo la vanguardia del progreso, cuando, cuando no lo es. Entonces sí hay una responsabilidad, eh, eh, sobre todo en la mirada, sobre todo en, en, eh, en, en cómo asumir a Cuba. Yo ya digo, eh, es muy difícil ayudar a los que a los que están allí eh, empujando un cambio porque justamente el régimen tiene una manta donde no deja penetrar nada pero um, sí creo que a nivel de comunicados a nivel de, de visión a nivel de, 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 de describir o decir lo que pasa allí sí hay una responsabilidad de la comunidad internacional que mira mal, mal a Cuba eh, y pasa algo eh, yo no tengo ya, ok. <laughs> so I, I think that um, you do what you can do. Um, <clears throat> because obviously uh, Cuba is an isolated place. Um, you don't, we don't have NGOs or international help. Um, there are so many restrictions. So the effects of all these uh, initiatives is limited. Um, And I'm not in favor uh, that any country uh, would intervene in uh, Cuba. I think uh, Cuba's problems have to be solved by Cubans. Um, but I do think that the international uh, community uh, has a big problem and uh, a big uh, responsibility in a way that uh, the opinion about Cuba is uh, most of the time wrong. Um, I think it's based on an error. Many people think that uh, Cuba is a progressive country, it's a leftist country, uh, whereas it's uh, ex uh, exactly the, the opposite. Um, so as long uh, as the European Union has this vision on Cuba, uh, it won't be favorable. And um, as long as Cuba has a seat uh, on uh, committees or uh, boards of that um, defend human rights, uh, to me that's incomprehensible. Um, well, also Saudi Arabia and so sit along these meetings, but I speak here for Cuba. And I think there are many people who uh, benefit from this idea of Cuba as a leftist country, as a progress, uh, progressive country. Um, I think there is a responsibility as how to view Cuba, and um, this is what has to change. Um, so, yes, that's um, yeah. how Cuba is described. Yeah. 
We are almost uh, uh, out of time, so I want to ask one last question before we go to the audience. Um, you are currently in Spain, uh, not in Cuba. Do you think that you will go back to Cuba eventually? Sí, sí, obvio. Eh, bueno, nunca había salido de Cuba y como todo ser humano me interesaba romper el huevo y ver que había fuera el caparazón y voy a estar un tiempo fuera, pero voy a seguir escribiendo, obviamente voy a volver. Eh, tengo un par de proyectos de libros que quiero desarrollar y una vez como tenga encaminado ya eso, obviamente, si sí, no es una salida para nada definitiva. Yes. Obviamente, eh, los libros no me lo iban a publicar en Cuba. Mm -hmm. Yes, obvious, obviously, I want to go back. Um, I, want, I, I couldn't left, uh, leave Cuba. Um, and, of course, as anyone else, I wanted to uh, break the shell of my egg and see what's outside of that. Uh, but no, I want to go back. I have a few uh, projects I want to write on. Uh, some books, um, and once I have that on track, I would definitely go back. Okay, thank you. I will now see if there are one or two questions from the audience, um, and then we're going to close off. Please notice that there is a live stream, so if you don't like uh, being on video, then sí. maybe uh, mm -hmm. keep your question for um, at the bar with a drink. Mm -hmm. So is there anyone who wants to? I see uh, the sir in the white shirt. Yes, Tim is coming to you with the microphone. No, he will hold it for you. He will hold it. No. <laughs> Tim, you have to come a little closer. Yeah. Me? Hold it. Okay. Uh, yeah, this was a first thing. Thank you to give me the opportunity to participate in this meeting. Oh, it's not a meeting. It's a presentation for the Abraham. Uh, like you see, I have many... <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe pick one for now. And this is going to be impossible to... To do it all, yes. So, uh, uh, in general, what I can see, I, uh, I am complete disappointment with almost everything the Abraham say, uh, talk. I've seen uh, uh, he say many lies, lies, mentiras, and manipulation about the Cuban reality and how he give any information uh, really uh, with proof. So uh, this uh, situation is very difficult because in this table, there is anyone uh, that can participate in the discussion with all the position of time. So I don't know where I can begin. Uh, uh, maybe I can. Uh, Latte, uh, sorry, sometimes I speak Netherlands. Um, uh, 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 I can get the people uh, to listen, for example, what has happened in November and July. This was a very big commotion for, for us here in, uh, in Netherlands and in, uh, in America. I have family in America, I have family in Venezuela. and. Uh, and all this speech, he don't talk nothing about the war between Cuba and the United States of America. He don't say nothing about the war with, uh, with the mafia of the government of the regime for Miami. He don't say nothing, many things that is happened, and all the history is not only the side what is going on in Cuba, because it's not uh, what is going on in Cuba. Okay. To, to, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Let me. Uh, yeah, this is the point. I, I, I want to. Uh, this is not time. I just to go to two minutes to. Uh, Maybe if you have one question. Yes. Then I, no, I, I, I going to put just uh, what somebody in Cuba say what's happened there. Um, and. Uh, well, and, and this this uh, situation was uh, yeah, here. This is uh, uh, what is uh, here? Oh yes, I have here. So yeah, I have. I have. Ah, what is? Embargo. No, it's not for embargo. It's another thing. Okay. It's another thing. 
Uh, what is that? Here, here. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, this, 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 this. Um, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So come now, come now. Come okay. Come now. It's uh, right okay. here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Um, yeah, we, we can't really see it. Maybe it's better if you uh, leave this for now and then after the program we will talk. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, is there anyone else who wants to have a quick question? Yes, here in the front. And then we will close off the program. Yeah, uh, first, uh, um, thanks to the, the, this place, the Valley, for this debate, because put uh, Cuba in the spotlight, which is very difficult. As a Cuban, so, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, great that Abraham is with us. Um, just a little bit agree, not totally agree with him. I really, for the for the sake of the debate, going to the follow up because uh, when the Cuban uh, society is very polarized, when you hear one side, you hear the other side, you it seems like you are talking about two different countries. So you're hearing from one side of the story. It's not so helpful to grasp uh, fully understanding of what is Cuba. Of the whole situation of Cuba, yeah. yes. So I understand what he's saying. No, yeah. I agree with him at all. <laughs> <laughs> I understand what he's saying. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I also have a lot of questions, but I understand the time is an issue. So it's limited, I, I, I yes. Won't, okay. I won't make any questions. I understand, of course. There's only so much we can do in two hours. And I think in this program we have... Uh, enlightened the story of Abraham of freedom of press and maybe in the next program we can talk about uh, the, the division within Cuba. Um, so I will now say to the live stream uh, viewers thank you very much for, uh, for viewing, uh, for being here with us at the Bali and hopefully we will see you in real life sometime very soon. Okay and thank you also everyone in the audience. Let's have a drink and let's talk further about Cuba.